Welcome to the Hudson Area Library's tour of Cedar Park Cemetery. It was named by the tour guide, Kelly Drahushik, Tales from Hudson's Crypt, the tour. So um, I'll tell you a little bit about Kelly, which a lot of you know her already. And she's here with her personal assistant, Evangeline. Uh, she's a longtime resident of Hudson. She has a family history that goes back to the 1800s in this area, and she'll be talking about that on the tour. And she, along with her husband, Alan, owns Body Dogs Books and Ale, which is in its, that was last year, 12th year of operation? 13th, 13th year of operation on Hudson's Warren Street in the former C.H. Evans Hook and Ladder Building. And that is her family, the Evans family. Um, she served on the library board and she continues to serve as a member of the History Room Committee. Uh, she's a great supporter of the library. We really appreciate her. And I'll read, uh, she earned a BS from Rochester Institute of Technology in Industrial Engineering. She has two adorable children. This is the end of her bio. She has two adorable children, a very chill cat, and two noisy guinea pigs that keep her quite busy. So Kelly will lead us in the tour. Hi, everybody. Um, does everybody have a map? Yes? Okay. So that's, you know, I'll be leading you around, but that's just going to be for your personal reference for later on if you want to try and replicate this tour. Um, so a couple of housekeeping things. First thing, I hope everybody wore sturdy, able to be wet, easily cleaned up shoes because we're not going to stick to the paths over there. We're going to be going in the grass. And I went over there a little bit yesterday, and not only is it wet, but there's also a lot of poop from various kinds of animals. So you're going to want to watch your step because of that, but also because the ground is very uneven. There's a lot of um, markers that are low to the ground that you might not see unless you're watching your feet. So please try to pay attention. Um, what we're standing in front of right now is the office for the cemetery. If you don't know Gail Grandinetti, she is amazing. And she's also helped me a lot when I put together this tour last year. Um, and she is just a font of knowledge. So if you want to know anything about the cemetery, you want to come investigate or walk around, you find something in just interesting over there that you want to know more about, you come here. She's here almost every weekday from 9 to 12.30. Um, I would call first, because sometimes she has other things going on. Um, and you can go into like the really creepy old safe and look at the super old books and find out really cool things. Um, Brenda, do we know when the Friends of the Cemetery is going to have their first meeting since Trick's in here? Yes. So it's, um, I think it's Tuesday from 6 to 8. I'm going to check in my calendar real You do quick. that and I'll just give some background. So last sure. year when I did this tour, um, at the end, when we were having cider and donuts and hanging out, uh, somebody approached me and said, is there a Friends of the Cemetery group? And I said, no, there is not. And they said, somebody should make one. And I said, it won't be me. <laughs> but luckily, we have uh, Rich Volo, who is an alderman in Hudson, and he is starting a Friends of the Cemetery group. So if anybody is interested in being involved or knowing more, Tuesday, October 30th at the library from 6 to 8 o'clock is their first meeting, the Friends of the Hudson Cemetery. And I guess that's they, this Tuesday, yes. And they could probably, at the end of this, give you their name if they can't make it Tuesday and we can get it to Rich. Somehow. Oh, yeah. If you want, if anyone would like. So how we're going to do this is I have the cemetery tour from last year, which basically encompasses the oldest parts of the cemetery and moves towards... The new, less old. The, the newer part. The less old. The less old, because it's still, it's pretty, still old. pretty old where I'm going to take you on that side. Uh, so we're going to... Well, at least it's newer, so we might as well just call it. Call it new? Okay. So then... Hey, Rich is here. Um, so then we're going to finish that end of the tour. We'll come here. We can snack and hang out. And then I have two more graves in the newer part, which is on this end. And so if anybody wants to see those two, I'll take them there. If you're done at that point, you're full of cookies, you want to go do whatever else you can. Um, the other thing I'm going to say is that today is a full day of Halloween spectacular in Hudson. So when we're done here, if you want to go downtown, there's going to be trick-or-treating on Warren Street from 2 to 4. And then at 4 o'clock, there will be a spectacular Halloween parade down Warren from Savin Street Park to the Opera House and really, like, 
the costumes are amazing. So even if you're not personally going to dress up, like, go to the spotty dog, have a beverage, then, like, watch the parade go. <laughs> Just a suggestion. Um, anybody who doesn't know Rich, he's here now. Yay. You want to say anything? One, most importantly, is I brought cookies for afterwards. So, and, and as shapes of tombstones and ravens, yes. Yay. Um, so, um, and number two is that this Tuesday at the library, uh, six o'clock, for anyone who is interested in starting a Friends of the Cemetery group to help um, make this cemetery, uh, to help some of the to some of the projects on the cemetery, such as like the fence, such as like uh, we're helping to restore some of the stones. But the cemetery needs a lot of work, um, and the money isn't necessarily always in the budget of the DPW. So um, I am also alderman for the fourth ward. Um, so if this Tuesday, um, six o'clock at the library, anyone is interested in helping us raise money to do some of the various projects here at the cemetery, which really need some help, that would be great. All right, and you can just talk to me. I'm around. All right, thank you. All right. So I will just start by giving you a little background on how this cemetery came to be. Um, in the early days of Hudson, there was the very, very early days when the proprietors first came and settled down by the waterfront, there was not really a graveyard per se. Um, so what would happen is either somebody had a little plot of land next to their house or churches had a little plot of land and that was where people were buried. Um, but when it got a little bigger here and that didn't really work out so well anymore because the place was expanding and really people wanted those plots where people were or didn't want to expand them. Um, it was decided by the proprietors that they should try and find a place for an actual cemetery. Um, and the place that they found was this plot of land here, which at the time was owned by a Colonel John Van Allen, who had originally sold the proprietors the land for Hudson itself. Um, he still owned this plot of land here, it was five acres. Uh, the proprietors sent a commission up to him and said, like, we would really like to do this thing. And he said, I will give you the land as long as you agree to use it as a cemetery and nothing else forever. And so that was the agreement. He donated the land to the city and now we have the cemetery. Um, Gail has told me that there are extensive acres here. We will not at any time in the future run out of space, even though it does look like that we will. Um, it's still pretty roomy. <laughs> Is there anything else I wanted to say about that? Oh, um, so the reason why the cemetery also looks like it does, which as you can notice, it's really beautiful here, was it was made during the time of the rural cemetery movement, which was basically getting away from having your graves in like a downtown lot and putting it in a place that's beautiful, where you would want to visit your relatives, walk, picnic, ride your bike, do whatever, um, and make it very pastoral and beautiful, and that's how we ended up with this spot that we have here. So what I'm going to have us do is walk around, go through those um, white pediments down there and into the cemetery, and I'll take you to the first graves, and we'll talk a little bit more about how the cemetery came to be and who's the first people in here. Follow me, follow me. And if I'm not loud enough, like, raise your hand or And then B, C, D. And B is sort of a little truncated. You only get like three B because it's like a point in the middle. But yeah, that's basically how we're laid out. So we're just going to go a little, little bit farther up. But as you can imagine, most of the oldest stuff is in half or A. Okay, but I am going to talk about him when we get up further because he's a relative of somebody we're going to talk about in a little bit. But Thomas Wiswall's grave is right here. Um, just to kind of give you an idea, he was a steamship captain um, because his father was one, a very famous one. So his grave's there, but we'll talk about him when we talk about his father up top. Little presentation, I thought this grave didn't exist, but because of certain people that do research about the cemetery, we found out this grave actually does exist. So it's not on your map, but you can mark it in there if you want to. It was founded by the proprietors. They pulled their money. They were... Um, wealthy sailors, whaling people in Nantucket. They pulled their money, they came here, they found this port, they decided it's where they wanted to settle. 
uh, they purchased the land from John Van Allen, and that's how Hudson was formed. It wasn't called Hudson at the time, but there you go. Um, a lot of the proprietors had the last name Jenkins. One of the most wealthiest and involved was Thomas Jenkins, and a lot of them are Quakers. So when you look at your map, too, um, if you looked, it's like sort of surrounding this gate, maybe a little to the left also. Um, and I don't think it's on the map. No, it's not. But encompasses part of half A, part of A, part of B, and part of half B um, in sort of a square. That was originally given by the proprietors to the Quaker meeting house here for them to have their dead buried there. Um, and I figured that Mr. Jenkins, being a good Quaker, was going to be buried in there, and I never found him, and I couldn't find the records. But it turns out that actually he's right here in this little tiny stone. Um, as you can see, he died in 1808. Um, he's buried next to his brother Marshall. Um, so this is, um, and I had thought, what you'll also notice if you look around in these older spots, there's a lot of empty space. Um, Quakers were known for being very, um, they didn't believe in ornamentation, they didn't believe in fanciness, they didn't believe in showiness. So a lot of Quakers were buried without a stone, so, or a very plain stone as he was. Um, so I just thought he had been buried without a stone because that would have made sense, but no, he's over here. Um, so although there are technically graves available within this space here, Gail has basically said they're not going to sell them because you might find a random somebody and disturb them. Okay, so we're going to move up this Kelly, way now. Kelly, yes? that, I'm sorry, does that mean that that we don't know all of the people buried here? Gail doesn't have all of the records? If you might well, because it's very, very early, plus um, there was a fire at one point early on and a lot of records were lost. So... Yeah, yeah, we don't actually know something. Okay, so we've already talked quite a bit about Colonel John Van Allen. Here is his marker. Um, he was actually the second person buried in the cemetery. Um, the first person that was buried here was uh, Mrs. Folger who was a wife of one of the proprietors. Um, and John Van Allen actually went to her funeral and to her internment in the cemetery. When he came home, he told his wife, it's so sad that Mrs. Folger is there alone. And then, two weeks later, Mr. Uh, Colonel, excuse me, John Van Allen joined her here, so she was no longer alone. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, Jackie just died. Yeah, he died. He just died. <laughs> He died. Let me see. Um, I'll also talk at this point about how um, when you see flags in all these graves, um, the VFW and the Daughters of the American Revolution does a really excellent job of keeping track of who's buried here where and keeping flags at their graves. Um, we have, according to them, 43 veterans of the Revolutionary War buried in this cemetery. We only know where 38 of them are buried. So if anybody wants a project, there you go. Um, and I will have you turn around. Let's see. Is he here? No. I'm going to have us back up a little bit. But I'll give you John Van Allen served as a lieutenant colonel commanding the 1st Clover Battalion of the Albany County Militia. He sold a large piece of the land to the original city proprietors to build the city. Seven of the original proprietors served during the war. And we're going to see a lot of them over here, but I'll give you the names. Stephen Paddock, Seth Jenkins, another Jenkins, Alexander Coffin, Nathaniel Green, John Thurston, Samuel Mansfield, and Hezekiah Dayton. Van Allen also donated the land for this cemetery. The thing I'm going to point out, too, is that, I don't know, Rich, has anybody in your group been cleaning the stones? Because somebody's been here cleaning. No, we haven't. So, I know Sue Kamira was. Know her, but she's been coming up. Has she been coming and got and she's cleaned a few of them. Yeah, because a lot of them look really great yeah. since the last time I gave the tour. Not on her own. That's nice. It looks beautiful because um, a lot of these were really hard to find when I initially came out here because they more look like this, which clearly is hard to read, versus that, which is beautiful. Um, so, like I said, this is one of the um, proprietors and also a Revolutionary War veteran. And if you kind of swing around to the other side, 
watch for the poop because it's all over here. Um, you'll see what the um, VFW and the Daughters of the American Revolution have done to kind of shore up the stones and also to give you their exact, you know, where they served, what regiment, and all of that. And you'll see stones all through this area with those backing up to them, which is really lovely. And, and there's no easy way to clean them. It's just a matter of, you know, soapy water, really, and slowly. Because you also work. don't want to ruin the engraving, so you can't really use anything harsh. What I'm going to find is that a lot of the stones, depending on the time of day, are harder or easier to read. Um, this one in like mid-afternoon on a sunny day is pretty good. Um, this gentleman's name is Cotton Gelston. Although he was not a proprietor, he did a lot for the city in the early days of the proprietors and came here with them and did a lot of things for them. I will read you all of his firsts. He was the first treasurer, first surveyor. He drew the first plot, drew the first deeds, opened the first store, and was the first postmaster of Hudson. Um, he also had a reputation of being a really angry guy, <laughs> from what I've read. Um, when Hudson was going to change from a proprietorship to be incorporated to a city, he was absolutely against it, and so against it that at the meeting where they were going to do it, he tried to snatch the records of the proprietorship from Seth Jenkins and light them on fire. Somebody actually tackled him and rescued the papers. Um, and I also know from records that he was a slaveholder, as many people were at the time. Um, there is a really great book that goes through all um, the Hudson Valley, goes through all the Hudson Valley um, advertisements that were taken out in various periodicals about um, runaway slaves and his is like the most horrible like advertisement of all of them because it basically said Whatever the slaves name was I would say he ran away, but basically he doesn't do that. So he walked <laughs> Which is like the rudest thing anyone could ever say So he did a lot for the city, but apparently not a nice guy Okay on to the next guy Let everybody get a chance Um, Shelly, In Defiance. Ah, thank you. Yeah, that's the title. The book's called In Defiance, thank if you. anybody wants to read it. Runaway from Slavery in New York, Hudson River Valley. Thank you. Yeah. Rinse so good. Okay, so as you can read, this is the grave of Dr. Moses' young love, and it used to be really sort of hard to read. It looks beautiful now. Um, I actually randomly found it because his wife's grave is next door. It said Polly, and that's in nice big letters, and I really like figured that one out first. Um, so he served as a brigade surgeon <coughs> under General Herkimer, um, and he was captured at the Battle of Oriskany and carried into Canada by a band of Iroquois Indians, where he was tortured and witnessed a lot of other people being tortured, including like... Uh, good enough. Um, like eaten. <laughs> so how we're gonna so do this? Is he didn't really like. I have the cemetery tour from that, last year, which basically encompasses the oldest I parts of the cemetery. But what he is really famous for is for that he was a very old. early the um, endorser. The, the less old, because so it's, it's still pretty old. Where I'm gonna take you on that box. side, which is very controversial at the time. Some of you might name know the name Cotton Mather. He. Um, so his then children we're going to finish small that end in of the a very tour. public here, way, and his house was and fire out, and then I have so this was like basically they thought you were the killing your children if you were newer part, part which is on uh, this end. turned out that's so not what happened, and the inoculation was a very there. important way of getting rid of smallpox. You want to go do whatever else you from that and made a big name. The other thing I'm going to say is that today is a full day of Halloween spectacular. Holly is very so when we're done here. If they, you want to go downtown, um, there's going to be never had trading on Warren but Street. They did adopt a niece of his. Also and then at 4 o'clock, there will be um, a spectacular Halloween parade down Warren from 7th Street the, not this Polly, to the Polly Opera Derby. House. And really name the mother to Samuel the Tilden. Is that name familiar amazing. to anybody? So even if you're not personally going to dress up like a spotty dog, have I'm a beverage, then like watch the parade go. Just a suggestion. Anybody who doesn't know Rich, he's here to be Hayes. 
Um, he He's buried in Cana. If any of you want to go there, you can see Samuel Tillen's grave. Um, and he was one of the first, well, I think he was the first, to win the popular vote but lose the Electoral College. It goes back. It goes back. Okay, so that's isn't this part. Kind of, isn't this kind of rare for these people to live to be 77 plus 85 in that time of period? Well, I'm going to give you my unscientific answer to that. Somebody could probably be better answering of that, but when they give you like life expectancy numbers for that time, you have to also consider that many, many women died in childbirth and children died very young. Well, presentation. So I think I it skews the numbers. Exist, but lower. because of Because when you're looking around the cemetery, you find people that are 90, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 70. Does and exist. I sort of so was not on your map, too. But you can and mark it in there if you want to. Yeah. So um, there's that. Now let me make sure I'm not missing anybody. We did do it now. Okay. We're going to go this way. Okay, so I told you we were going to talk more about Wiswalls. We stopped t uh, for a brief time at Thomas's. This is Captain Samuel Wiswall. Um, he is a brother to Oliver Wiswall, who we're going to talk a lot about in a second when we go, after we go up there and end up over there. Um, he, let's see, where am I? Wiswall, Wiswall, Wiswall. Ah. Um, so Commodore Wiswall was basically uh, Robert Fulton's right-hand man. He helped him build and design the first steamship that was on the Hudson. Um, he was a pilot of the Claremont. Um, he was also appointed the New York Port Warden at a certain point. And he was the captain of the James Kent at the time when uh, the Marquis de Lafayette, after the end of the war, took a tour of the Hudson Valley. He basically piloted the ship up the Hudson River and Lafayette came here and stopped in Hudson. It was basically a really big do. Um, you can find online a big description of what happened. There was ladies dressed fancy, there was going to be a ball, there was going to be all these things. And I think it was probably very boring for Lafayette because it just sounded like he basically was in a receiving line for like an hour and then had to leave. <laughs> Didn't get any food. Um, so, uh, steamship captains were a really big deal at the time. He was one of the best known. Um, his son went into the family business and then became also uh, a steamship pilot. He also piloted the James Kent for a time. And if you're looking for a book about um, steamships from back in the day, you can, there is a book called <laughs> <laughs> Tragedy on the Hudson or something like that. And it's all about how these ships used to like explode and fire and kill everybody like quite often. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right, so now we're only going kitty corner to this, like, sandstone color. So he is a relative to me by marriage. He was also a business partner to Oliver Wiswall, brother to the steamship captain, who we're going to talk more about later. Um, Solomon Westcott was a wealthy local merchant. Um, he was also a city supervisor. He was a postmaster, so you get, like, weird things at my mother's house, like the postmaster certificate for this guy signed by Martin Van Buren, which is kind of cool. Um, and, oh, under true presence, so Andrew Jackson was the other one. Um, so his daughter Harriet married Robert Evans, which is my four <laughs> times great grandfather or something to that effect. Um, <clears throat> somebody asked me on the last tour, like, when did he die? Because this is a very uh, good example of Egyptian revival architecture. Um, and I tried to like nail down the time of when Egyptian revival architecture was, but it sort of just depends on if somebody in the area liked that style, then it sort of like when King Tut's tomb was found, that was popular. But um, it sort of is just, I couldn't nail down a time period but some of his relatives are buried down the way and their crypt is also Egyptian revival. <laughs> they were fans. All right, now we're gonna go up the hill. I'm just gonna say basically that if, you know, you're gonna pick a grave site, like this is a really spectacular one. The views are like unmatched. Um, so you are looking at the Gifford family plot. Has anybody ever heard of Sanford Gifford? Uh -huh. Sanford Gifford is a Hudson River School painter. 
Um, uh, so as what as is um, Frederick Church, Thomas Cole, and a lot of other people from the area. That school of painting basically uh, talks about like the discovery of the pure America, where you know big vistas, one with nature, that sort of thing. His particular specialty was luminism, which if you look at his paintings, you can look them up online, they're there. Um, it's like a uh, really spectacular use of paint to make it look just like the paintings lit up. It's beautiful. Um, <clears throat> let's see. He served in the Civil War. I don't know why we don't have a flag here, but he did serve in the Civil War. Um, he died of malaria in 1880, at which point there was an ex exhibition of his work at the Met. It consisted of over 160 paintings. Um, he did over 700 works in his career. They're still being found. There was one found on uh, Antiques Roadshow at one point. You could probably find that episode online somewhere too. Um, <laughs> and let's see. Oh, so the other thing I wanted to point out with this plot was this plot looks pretty nice right now for the reason that um, one of our local antique dealers was wandering through the cemetery at one point and came across this plot, which looked basically like a lot of plots look down there. We're on a hill, we're very gravity challenged, and as you can see, the uh, our filming cameraman over here has his hand on a grave that had fallen over and split in half. You can see where that happened. There was a giant bush growing out here that had knocked over a bunch of the stones and they basically looked gray and ruined and a lot of them fallen over. Um, so he took it upon himself to do a GoFundMe or one of those sort of things at the time to raise enough money to fix the plot, clean the stones, reset everything, and make it look as nice as it looks. Well, it looked pretty much like the really clean ones. It doesn't take long for them to start looking like this because that was probably mid-aughts, I'm gonna say. Um, so does anybody wanna guess how much it would cost to do something <laughs> like this or how long it would take? The whole. The whole plot, so from there <laughs> up here. There was one guy who specialized in this sort of restoration. He came for the better part of a summer, two to three months, and the restoration cost $16,000. Yeah. They basically dug all, you know, because this, these parts are not just sitting on the ground, they're in. So he had to dig it all out, put stone, reset the stones, clean them off, and fix the broken ones. And um, it, it's funny to revisit this plot, like, after a year and after another year because it just, you can see it. Nature will have its way. All right, my favorite story is coming up next. Please watch, because if you go to... This is the grave of Alfred Corning Clark. Yes, he is by himself in there. Um, I'll get to that in a second. Um, but before we talk about him, we have to talk about his father, who in theory is also buried here somewhere and I can't find him. Um, his name is Edward Cabot Clark. Um, he was a lawyer practicing in Hudson. His father-in-law was Ambrose Jordan, who was a big time lawyer in Hudson. He married Ambrose Jordan's daughter, joined his law firm. The Jordan plot, by the way, is if you look over there to that sad looking Madonna on top of that stone right there, that's the Jordan plot. Edward might be in there somewhere, not sure. Those are very like, those really need somebody to come and do a cleaning job because what I've also learned walking around the cemetery is like a tree may seem like a lovely idea, but really it like shades you and makes you just ready to grow stuff. <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, Edward Cabot Clark, in his practice, it was here first, then they moved to New York City because they got fancier, um, encountered a client that did not have very much money to procure services. However, he was very talented. That person was, um, uh, I can't remember his first name. Anyway, Singer of the Singer Sewing Machine uh, Empire. Now, in order to talk about how Edward came into what he came into, you gotta talk about Singer first. Singer was a actor, tinkerer, holder of a lot of patents, and just kind of 
nuts. <laughs> he was a big brawler. He was a big drinker. He had 25 different children with five different women, not all of them his wives. 25? <laughs> um, he was sued for bigamy um, and just basically was in trouble a lot. And if you look up a portrait of him online, the painted portrait of him is amazing because he looks just, he's got whiskers and he's got like a big robe and he's like very uh, ready for something. <laughs> anyway, um, so he, at the time he came to the law office, didn't have a lot of money. He was a struggling actor, but had various patent work that he needed done. Ambrose Jordan, the head of the firm, found him personally detestable and passed him on to his son-in-law, because that's what you do. Um, so Edward took him on and said, okay, you don't have any money. I'm willing to do this work for you because I see promise here. Um, but I'm going to take half of whatever business it is that you decide to form. And he was like, fine. So what that was was the Singer Sewing Machine Company. Mm -hmm. uh, Alfred did not invent the... No, Alfred, sorry. Isaac what? Isaac. Isaac, thank you. I just looked it up for you. Oh, <laughs> see, I'm not quick enough with this stuff. <laughs> Isaac it was not the inventor of the sewing machine, but he made various patents that made it much more possible for people to have a sewing machine in their own home versus <coughs> professionally done in a factory or in somebody's production facility. Um, what Edward also came up with, which made the company very wealthy, is the possibility of buying something on credit. So put $5 down, $3 a month, and you too could have a Singer sewing machine mm -hmm. in your home which just caused an explosion of people having sewing machines in their home, most of them singers. Now, uh, Edwards also, a uh, thing that he had to do was basically work hard behind the scenes to keep Isaac out of trouble, to manage the books, and to uh, run the business, essentially. So he earned his money, and he made a lot of it. What he did with his money then was not only have the sewing machine company, but also he built a very famous building in New York that some of you may know, um, which, <laughs> um, oh my God. See, this is what happens when you get old and you don't have notes, <laughs> is that you can't like remember the things that you want to talk about. The Dakota. Thank you. I was going to say, where was John Lennon shot? <laughs> um, so he built the Dakota. He built it on the Upper West Side when there was nothing on the Upper West Side and when it was absolutely unheard of for a wealthy person not to own their own home. Um, he was the first to have the idea that you could build a very fancy apartment building and wealthy people could rent from you and live there. And that's basically what all of New York is right now. <laughs> um, so he died before the Dakota was completed. Um, Alfred was his only living child at that time, so Alfred inherited everything. All the real estate holdings, his parts of the business and everything else. So Alfred was made a very wealthy person. Um, he had four children. Some of them you may know. If you've ever been to the uh, Sterling Clark Art Institute in Massachusetts, that's his son Sterling and his wife Francine. Um, if you have ever been to the Museum of Modern Art in New York, that's his other son Stephen who gave a big uh, chunk to do that. And they also uh, are big contributors in forming the Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown, where they lived for many years. Um, so this very fancy grave is just Alfred. Um, it is taking care, his family has given money to the cemetery, gives on a regular basis, so it'll be maintained in perpetuity. So he gets like really nice special treatment. Um, I was told that uh, by somebody on one of my last tours that when they used to play in the cemetery when she was a child, um, this was one of the places they really liked to come because the whole outer edge was just planted with red flowers and it looked especially beautiful. Mm -hmm. Of course, the things that are leaving poop all over the cemetery come and eat the flowers now, so we just don't usually do that thing. So that is Alfred. If anybody wants to come and have a look, it's like, this is not a bit, it's a nice view from here, too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Kelly, was there, a, was there a connection with Coats and Clark? There is a Coats and Clark that makes sewing notions, right. but I don't know if it's theirs. It might be, because the people that maintained for the cemetery didn't know anything about, like, the ties to the sewing machine company, but knew Coats and Clark and said that's, he's a Coats and Clark guy. So, probably. <laughs>
just get all the parts. Russia. Oh, So on the back end is the other Egyptian revival uh, crypt. It's like a really good one too. It's got like funky designs on the front. All right. And I'm totally wrong. Okay, so I said he was the brother to Samuel Wiswell. I'm wrong. He was Samuel Wiswell's. Samuel Wiswell was his father. His brother was Thomas. So now we're here. So his uncles were Marshall and Lemuel Jenkins. We saw Marshall's grave with Thomas buried kind of next door. Lemuel was over there too. Um, he moved to Hudson when he, Oliver, moved to Hudson when he was nine with his mother. Um, Lemuel owned a farm on Mount Marino Road. Um, some of you may know the spot now is the place where um, Giffy Whitbeck has that really, had that really beautiful house that overlooks the lighthouse. Um, and he, Oliver, man, helped manage the farm over there with a buddy of his. And at that time, uh, Chancellor Livingston had traveled over to Europe and had um, seen in France that they had merino sheep, which was the same kind of sheep that they used um, to make really nice wool to make clothes. At that time, the United States was importing all of its wool and Livingston saw the opportunity that maybe this was something we could do in the United States. So what he did was he, um, Oliver decided that, saw Livingston, saw him doing this and thought, yeah, this is a good thing. I'm going to do that. So he invested in a flock of Merino sheep, which is why now that place where the, the house is is called Mount Merino Road. The first time it was ever referred to as Mount Merino was in an advertisement for the Merino sheep. Mm put by Oliver Wiswell. Um, but that's not the only thing we're going to talk about with Oliver Wiswell. Um, he basically was the person, one of the main instigators, if you will, of separating Greenport from Hudson. Um, <laughs> and the reason why makes perfect sense. If you live in Hudson, you don't mind paying taxes for, you know, street cleaning, police, whatever all else you were paying taxes for at the time. But if you live out on Mount Marino Road, you're very far from Hudson and you really don't like paying those taxes because they're not getting you anything. Um, so he was one of the instigators for doing separating Hudson and Greenport. It happened in 1837. Um, prior to that happening, he was mayor of Hudson in 1827. Um, Anything else? Oh, ah, yes, this is also what I wanted to say. And these were all things I found out since my last tour because there's a very good book put out by the Greenport Historical Society, which is our co sponsor of this tour in 1987. It's called um, Greenport, the Forgotten Town. Um, and it had a lot of really good information in it. I bought it at a Hudson Library book sale, so you never know what you will find there. Um, in 1824, he was the owner of the Weekly Gazette which was a newspaper in Hudson run with Solomon Westcott, who's very nice crypt we saw back there. Um, he formed also the Hudson River Bank in 1830, which is now a part of Key Bank. Um, and in 1836 was when he built his house on Mount Marino Road, when he inherited the property from his uncle Lemuel. Um, so yeah, you can look him up too, and he had like also a ton of firsts in Hudson as well. He was very civically minded. Now what we're going to do is walk ahead to between those two pine trees, and that is the Civil War Cemetery. Terry, um, my daughter has planted her behind on the grave of Samuel Cowles. I'm sorry, David Cowles. Um, he was Yale educated, and he was the Columbia County uh, District Attorney three times in his life. He served under Tecumseh Sherman, and he basically raised um, the whole militia in Columbia County when the war was declared. Um, he uh, served under Tecumseh Sherman. He um, fought very validly, very bravely um, during the fight. When he was injured and killed in battle, he was shot by the enemy and he made his uh, soldiers take him and turn him around and he's like, I want my mother to know that I died facing the enemy. <coughs> 
<laughs> okay, so what you'll also notice about the Civil War graves here is that as opposed to all the other graves, we have graves with flags that are very high up, sticking up over the tops of the, the graves here. Um, this cemetery, this plot specifically, became a news item, oh, I'm gonna say five-ish years ago, um, because somebody was stealing all the flags off the graves. They would get put here, <laughs> and someone would steal them. And this made the local VFW very angry because that's desecrating the grave <coughs> of a soldier. So, obviously. Um, they disappeared once, they put the flags back. They disappeared again, they put the flags back. They disappeared a third time. And so at that point, they got the police involved, they notified the news, they offered a reward for whoever would catch the person that was taking the flags. And they rigged a camera up to one of these trees to see if they could catch a person if they came back the fourth time. And what they caught on film with their cameras the fourth time were groundhogs. <laughs> Ripping the flags off the poles and taking them down into their hole. Um, so this is why now we have groundhog proof ways to put our flags up and the flags have been fine ever since. If you want to look it up on YouTube, this was on I think it was CBS. I remember. Yeah. 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 Nightly show. news. They actually sent somebody here, did like a whole thing of like sending a scope down into the groundhog <laughs> hole to see if they could find the flags. And yeah. it's really hilarious. And there's a lot of old timers from Hudson that you'll see in the film, and it's priceless. <laughs> um, and I show it when I do my tour indoors, which luckily we didn't have to do today. So. <laughs> All right. And we're going to go that way. This is the only females on my tour, sadly to say, but you know, history was written by men, I suppose. <laughs> um, <laughs> so this is the Andrews sisters, are you looking at on this side? It's Cornelia, Theodosia, Andrews, and her sister, I think, is on Robert, Matilda. Is she under this one? Ah, Anna Hogaboom. Cornelia Theodosia and Anna Hogaboom. Um, they were sisters, and uh, in, let's see, they spent their winter in 1911 and 12 in Europe. They were pretty wealthy for their time. Um, Cornelia was actually president of the Hudson Hospital at the time for a couple of terms, I guess is what you would call it. Um, so she was very active in town, and um, Anna was married to a Hogaboom, which was a very well-known local family, very prominent. So they, you know, lived a nice sort of life. They traveled a lot. They spent 11 and 12 in Europe. When they decided to come back, they booked a trip on a very fancy modern ship, and they were very excited because oh. it was the maiden voyage. Oh. Unfortunately, that ship turned out to be the Titanic. Um, so they survived, luckily, um, but you can go online. The, the thing I learned, I was like, I will never find anything about these people. They didn't die on the Titanic, but no, you can go on any page online about the Titanic and there's about a volume on everybody that was on the ship, regardless of whether they lived or died. Um, these two happened to live. They uh, were in their staterooms when they heard commotion outside, peeked outside of the stateroom and somebody came running down the hall and was like, no, no, no problem, go back to bed. And they were like, okay and they went back to bed and then somebody came like running down the hallway a few minutes later and they were like no no it's all good you can go back to bed and um cornelia being the older what, maybe more worldly one was like mm, no i think we're gonna put our life jackets on and go up to the deck which they did um they ended up on one of the lifeboats they were totally miffed because they were also traveling with their niece who ended up having to row because one of the stewards who got on the boat with them refused to row. Um, so the, yeah, <laughs> so she had to row. Um, and after various trials and tribulations, they were picked up and deposited back in New York City and came back here. Um, you can read about their exploits online. I think Cornelia sued the White Star Line for the loss of her trunk of clothing and her ostrich plume hat and whatever the heck else. There's a list of all of it in there. Um, <laughs> and uh, their, their sworn testimony for what happened to them and what they saw in the night is also online. Um, 
Cornelia only lived a couple more years. She was much older than her sister, and she died of pneumonia. Um, Anna lived quite a long time after the Titanic disaster, and basically it didn't stop her. She kept traveling all through Europe and for the rest of her life. So there you have it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, we're gonna go back up to the road and then left. I'll just say that, like, you know, one of the nice things about when you're gonna do a cemetery talk is like you can research your own relatives. And uh, this is my mom is in Evans, so this is the Evans family crypt. Um, and when I said I was gonna do this presentation, the first thing I did was like, well, this one's easy. I'll just go ask my mom. Mom, who's buried in the Evans crypt? Well, there's plaques for, you know, blah, 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 and your grandfather's in there. I'm like, and? I don't know. I have no idea. I ask your Aunt Susan. Aunt Susan, who's in the crypt? I have no, who knows? I don't know who's in there. I'm like, okay, well, so that's when Gail Grandinetti in the office becomes really handy because she can tell you who's in your family crypt when your family doesn't know. Um, so this is the Evans family crypt. Like I said, I am an Evans on my mom's side. Um, what we're probably most famous for, there are various Evanses. Uh, Cornelius Henry was a mayor of Hudson. If you go into the chambers in there, you can see his, very, look for the guy with the very big whiskers, that's him. Um, but I'll start from the beginning. In 1820, Robert, who married the daughter of Solomon Westcott, um, bought and established a brewery from George Robinson, which is down by the waterfront. Um, Robert was also very civic-minded in town. He was a treasurer and an alderman. Um, his only son was Cornelius. He was made partner at 19 in the brewery. Um, he served two terms as mayor. Um, and when he died, C.H. Jr. and Robert, who wasn't a junior, um, inherited the business. And then, sadly, uh, there was this thing that happened called Prohibition, <laughs> um, which my family basically was of two thoughts on that. One was, ah, uh, forget it, we'll just sell everything and get out of the business. And the other side was like, we'll just mothball everything and wait for this ridiculousness to blow over, um, which sadly took a lot longer than was expected by my family. Um, but we did retain the rights to the, um, the logo, the name, uh, the recipes, and all of that. Um, so uh, after Prohibition was over, my family was basically done with that stuff. Um, they had sold the building at one point. They think it was sold to either Legs Diamond or somebody in his circuit of gangsters um, who was illegally brewing in there for a time. And then the building just all of a sudden strangely caught fire one night. Um, yeah, so <laughs> there's not even a building for anyone to see anymore. Um, you yeah, know, it was probably a really good insurance claim on that. Uh, so, um, and any of you who might know me probably know my uncle is C.H. Evans the fourth. He owns the Albany Pub Station in Albany, and you can still drink Evans Ale. Uh, on tap the Spotty Dog up there, and in many fine establishments throughout Hudson and the Hudson Valley. Um, so anyway, which brings me back to me having to put this tour together and asking my family who's in there and all of them going. So I go to Gail in the office, and it took me a few times to figure out who exactly was in here. Does anybody want to hazard a guess as to how many people are in here? Four. No. Nope. Guess. Nope. Plaque, four plaques. There's four plaques, but there's many more people in there. Those are the four that served in the military. So they get plaques. So it's more than four. What's that? No, not that many. We have room for 20. Currently there's 19 in there. Um, actually, there's probably room for more. Um, but Gail only had so many references in her office. I We had to actually get the the key, which is about this big and that big around, to like, and then force our way into here, which was kind of hard because nobody had been in there since the 80s when my grandfather died. Um, and I had to like count around and see who was in there. Um, but it really is fascinating because it's sort of just a microcosm of what life sort of looked like at certain times in history. There's a lot of, well, there's not a lot. There's a couple infants in there, children that died very young. 
wives and second wives are in there. Um, so uh, there's 19 people. There's a lot more room. I don't know that I'll really be wanting to go in there, but <laughs> I'll be dead. So you know, whatever my family wants to do, I'm whatever. Um, but my, uh, it was funny because my grandfather's in there, and my nana at one point I had asked her, you know, where she was. Show she used to do everybody's plot and stuff to put the flowers and do all the whatever. And I was like, and she was like, and I'm gonna be buried here. And I'm like, well, wait, aren't you want to be? Don't you want to go in the crypt where Poppy is? And she's like, I don't want to be in there with all those men. <laughs> <laughs> but it turns out there's a lot of ladies in there too. She would have been okay. Um, so yeah, so this was the original end of my tour, but I have one more grave that's that way. So why don't we go see it? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so as you might have noticed by the big lettering up there, this is the grave of Fred Jones. This is a mausoleum versus a crypt, which I learned because a mausoleum is not underneath the earth, crypt is in the earth. Um, there you have it. Okay, so this mausoleum was built with stone from his quarry, which he owned. It was the um, Hudson Shell Marble Quarry, which, is, which was where Atlas Cement now is. Um, although the facade this part, was built with very nice Italian marble. It has eight catacombs inside. There's only four of them that are occupied that I could figure out I could find. Um, <laughs> so where his, um, his quarry was, was basically called Jonesburg by all the locals. Um, he had, uh, he was harvesting limestone, granite, and shell marble, which is a really beautiful, like, pinkish marble. Some of the um, Capitol building in Albany is built in the marble from his quarry. Um, he was a Greenport Town supervisor for eight terms. He was the Justice of the Peace for three terms. Um, so what would happen was he would harvest these giant blocks of limestone or marble or whatever. He had giant wagons hitched with large teams of mules and he would drag them through Hudson down to the waterfront to put on ships to send places. And at various points, all the residents would complain about the loudness, the rumbling, and the swearing of the mule drivers down the Warren Street, or down the various streets of Hudson, so some things never change because people still complain about traffic in Hudson. Um, <laughs> so it's been since then. But then when that seemed to be not really efficient and when it got to be in vogue, he decided he was going to be, build a railroad so he could move his stuff out of the quarry. So he built a very short rail line in 1889. It carried his product to the river. And later Atlas Cement used it to carry their stuff to the river until trucks became much more viable to do that thing. Um, so he called it the Jones Mountain Railroad. Um, and what he did as a stunt at the time was he sent passes out to all the other railroad magnates who were building railroad lines at the time, inviting them to come on the maiden voyage of his rail line. And they all were like, we don't know this guy, but we'll send him passes for our railroad too. So he got like all these passes on railroads that were actually like railroads. Um, so uh, basically he, he designed this uh, mausoleum for himself. Um, and he bought the plot here. He started building it. Unfortunately, he died before it was completed. Um, so what they did was basically take his coffin and just sort of stick it in there and wait to finish the inside or whatever. Else. It's still done. Um, unfortunately, he had taken out a loan to do that thing of buy this plot and build this thing. And his quarry went on hard times and they didn't really have enough money, so he got evicted from here at a certain point and his, his coffin was removed and it was buried in another plot in the cemetery for a time. His daughter May was his only surviving relative. She basically at some point was able to sell the quarry, get enough money, finish this, put him back where he belonged. Um, and so she's also buried in there and uh, her 
when Fred died, she had no relatives, and she basically adopted her housekeeper and her housekeeper's son as her family. And the censuses back in those days, they're listed as her family. Yeah. Um, so uh, this part of this part of the talk came out of the Greenport, The Forgotten Town book that I got, but also Carol Osterink. If a lot of you attend at the Greenport Historical Society, did a huge presentation about figuring out a lot of this to do with Fred Jones. Um, so her blog is Gossips of Rivertown. If you search it online, you'll find it, and you can read more about the story sort of goes on beyond what happened to May and the people that are also buried in here. Um, it's fascinating. <laughs> so that, unless anybody has any questions, this is sort of my last stop on this portion of the tour. I, how much would this cost to build when oh, it's built? I have no idea. Is it like put a quarry out of, is it bankrupt his quarry? Well, this didn't bankrupt his quarry. It was just other things that bankrupted his quarry, but. <laughs> but yeah, this would be expensive. I have no clue. But yeah, you can peek in there. You can see me very easily. It's visible. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. And like, do only family members have access to these crypts and mausoleums? And like, yes. So, for example, my family crypt. I go to the office. I see Gail. She opens the big safe and goes inside. And there's a drawer that you pull out, and there's big clunkety keys. I was wondering. I was like, are these keys? Do they all come with gold keys? I suppose it depends. I mean, it. When I say it took us a while to get into my crypt, like I couldn't do it alone. I had to go get my husband and somebody from the cemetery came with us and the two of them had to like force the door open and then we sort of broke it and then we had to wedge an Altoids tin in the door and like get it to close again because <laughs> I was really like, if I break the door and my dead is exposed to the elements, I'll be really sad. <laughs> um, so yeah, I don't know. I mean, I'm sure some of the crypts probably don't really have surviving relatives or relatives that don't know, so I don't know. But yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kelly. That Yay, was really Kelly. Cool. Um, so, Rich brought us cookies. Um, if anybody liked what they heard today and is able, we would be more than pleased to take a donation for the History Room and the Greenport Historical Society because yes. that is how we continue our work and provide these programs to people. Um, and also, there are two bonus graves on the other side of the cemetery after we have cookies. If anybody wants to come see those, I'll take you there. Oh, wow, great. And um, I do have a donation box, as Kelly said. This is a collaboration of history, uh, the Hudson Area Library History Room, and it's part of our local history speaker series and the Greenport Historical Society. And um, our next talk is Thursday, November 1st. Lance Wheeler will be talking about local news to local history. He's been a newsman in the local area for decades, and some of his news has gotten into history, I think, at this point. So he'll be isolating some of the best stories that he's covered and speaking about that. And also, December 1st, the Hudson Area Library History Room will be at the former police station on Warren Street for Winter Walk. We're really oh, cool. excited about that. So um, we will be there with lots of information. Come and ask your questions, ask about resources. We'll have our computers. We'll have a whole display in the former police station window. And uh, I just want to thank you all and remind you again, anyone who came late, you can talk with Rich Volo, but he is starting the Friends of Hudson Cemetery uh, group and they'll be meeting at the library Tuesday at six o'clock. Oh and I have some